Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm pleased to speak today to uh, the SDTC scandal. You know, this organization had a key mandate. It's federally funded, nonprofit, that's approved and was to disperse over $100 million in funds annually to clean technology companies. Sustainable Development Technology Canada, or SDTC, was established in 2001 by the Government of Canada through the Canada Foundation for Sustainable Development Technology Act to fund the development and demonstration of new technologies that promote sustainable development. It was to be an arm's length not-for-profit organization that was created to support projects that develop and demonstrate new technologies that address issues related to climate change, air quality, clean water, and clean soil. Well, clearly it must have functioned quite well up until around 2017, 2018, when government changed hands and it fell under the responsibility of our Liberal government. Next. Actually, the Liberal government. I have trouble saying our because I don't feel it's representing me or my riding. In 2018, former Liberal Industry Minister Navdeep Baines expressed concerns regarding the Harper era chair of SDTC, Jim Belsilli, <clears throat> sorry, given his public criticism of government privacy legislation. The minister's office expressed its discomfort about his comments with the CEO of SDTC, and he requested that the chair stop criticizing government legislation. Well, at that point, the minister proposed two alternative chairs to the CEO of SDTC as replacements in a phone call. One of the candidates proposed was Annette Bersheron, an entrepreneur who was receiving SDTC see funds, funding through one of her companies. So the minister, the PMO, and PCO, they were warned of the risks associated with appointing a conflicting chair and are told that up until this point, the fund has never had a chair with interest in companies receiving funding from SDTC. Sounds like it was run well with proper oversight. But in June 2019, Minister Baines decided to proceed with the appointment of Ms. Bersheron, despite repeated warnings expressed at his office. So the new chair went on to create an environment where conflict of interests are tolerated and managed by board members. Whoa. Board members go on to award SDTC funding to companies in which board members hold stock or positions within the company that are receiving the funding. Minister Baines goes on to appoint two other controversial board members who engaged in unethical behaviour in breach of the Conflict of Interest Act by approving funding to companies in which they hold ownership stakes. You know, th this is beyond the pale for Canadians. They are at the point where they go, is there anything that this government does that doesn't serve itself or those who are part of its uh, larger group? ISED officials witnessed 186 conflicts at the board, but they didn't intervene. January 2021, uh, the minister, I'm forgetting his uh, writing, sorry, the minister, the new minister, becomes the new minister of industry replacing Navdeep Baines after a decision to not run for re-election. Mr. Baines, I guess, decided uh, that would be a wise decision on his part. In November 2022, whistleblowers raised internal concerns with the Auditor General about unethical practices that were taking place. Privy Council is briefed by the whistleblowers about the allegations shortly after and commissioned two independent reports. In September 2023, the whistleblowers take the allegations public and the Minister agrees finally to suspend SDTC funding. Things are a mess. November 2023, the Auditor General announces an audit. And in June of 2024, the Auditor General report is released, finding severe government failures. You know, the Auditor General and Ethics Commissioner initiated these separate vis uh, investigations after whistleblowers came forward with allegations of financial mismanagement of the fund, at the fund. And, you know, I have to say, it's it's... An amazing thing when people are willing to put 
their reputation, their lives, their futures on the line because they see something like this taking place within our government. And so I applaud them uh, for making that decision and to move forward with that. And I'm just going to take a moment here to share some of the quotes of the whistleblower uh, that were shared at, uh, as committee testimony. And uh, I'm quoting, I think the Auditor General's investigation was more of a cursory review. I don't think the goal and mandate of the Auditor General's office is to actually look into criminality. I'm not surprised by the fact that they haven't found anything criminal because they're not looking at intent. If their investigation was focused on intent, of course they would find the criminality. And then went on to say, I know the federal government like the minister has continued saying there is no criminal intent and nothing was found. But I think the committee would agree that they're not to be trusted on this situation. What a sad comment to have to be made of the government that is responsible for Canadian taxpayers' dollars. He said, I would happily agree to whatever the findings are by the RCMP, but I would say that I wouldn't trust that there isn't any criminality unless the RCMP is given full authority to investigate. And of course, I couldn't agree more as well as uh, my colleagues on this side of the House. <clears throat> he said, I don't think we should leave it to the current federal government or the ruling party to make those deci decisions. Obviously, an incredible lack of trust from those employed uh, and our public servants who are responsible for working with these organizations that they see clearly are being abused by the federal government. Just as I was always confident, he said, that the Auditor General would confirm the financial mismanagement, I remain equally confident that the RCMP will substantiate the criminal activities that occurred within the organization. Uh, one more that I think is really important. It really, really hit me when I, I read what he said. The true failure of the situation stands at the feet of our current government, whose decision to protect wrongdoers and cover up their findings over the last 12 months is a serious indictment of how our democratic systems and institutions are being corrupted by political interference. You know, the, the political interference level of this uh, Liberal NDP government, I think, is beyond anything in the history of Canada. And now, so we're dealing with internal political interference and with international interference under this government's watch. He said it should never have taken two years for the issues to, be, to reach this point, and what should have been a straightforward process turned into a bureaucratic nightmare that allowed SDTC to continue wasting millions of dollars, millions of taxpayer dollars, and abusing countless employees over the last year. And that really hit me. Of course, the wasting of Canadian taxpayer dollars, especially when it's related to supposedly doing things that will improve our environment because this government cannot get off of its uh, need for, for taxing Canadians with a carbon tax because of the work that needs to be done to make sure that our country and our world is sustainable for the next generations. And in the meantime, they are taking those exact dollars set aside for green uh, technologies and improvements and spending them by giving them quietly to companies that have ulterior uh, motives with that money and no intention of using it for its supposed environmental process. So this alone, when you have Canadians who are paying those carbon taxes, not getting back what they have put into it, and facing higher costs for fuel, for food, and now for their housing, for everything because of the added <clears throat> down the line cost of that carbon tax, it just well, we know where it's leading Canadians, and we know how desperate they are in wanting a new future for Canada, which of course will come when the Conservative Party of Canada has the incredible honour to form government soon. But the second part, and abusing countless employees over this last year. You know, this is a government that talks about how much they appreciate the people behind the scenes, what a high quality of people they are that serve the government. Um, and, and here we have an individual talking about how they abuse countless employees. This does not speak 
to a government that is a servant, but rather a master, determining that, that what they want will happen my way or the highway, and who's in the way doesn't matter. Uh, they're willing to, to put them under the bus. So there are so many violations here of Canadians' trust. And my colleague uh, from Saskatoon West, um, spoke of many, many other issues uh, that this government has been part of, with, with um, all the way back to the ad scam, up to um, the, the WE um, challenge, the, the ad scam. I mean, there's just so many. Um, I, I have one myself that I can't help but recall that really hit me as a new member of parliament when I had the opportunity to speak for the first time um, to an issue in the House of Commons. It, w it was a bill brought forward by the federal government uh, to be discussed uh, with a, an environmental um, <clears throat> framework. So um, I, I just want to find it here. Please. Ah, here we are. You know, sorry, too many pages. Ah, here we are, yes. It was actually the first debate I participated in that sought to remove the government's accountability in this House to the House of Parliament. It was in regard to an environmental framework, as I mentioned, and the bill sought to give sweeping power to the minister and accountability to an advisory board. Well, I was somewhat concerned about this. I thought, well, what is this advisory board? I had not heard a lot about this approach. And so I, I asked um, the individual who had spoken from West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, Sea to Sky Country, about this board and what it was supposed to look like, how it would function, how many people would be on it, and where they'd come from, uh, what would their qualify, qualifications and credentials be, and, and what would their mandate be and for how, you know, all of these types of questions because we're at the beginning of discussing the potential of this bill and wanting to give good feedback on what we th thought was appropriate or not. Well, he stood up and immediately was so pleased to say that that board had already been chosen. Already chosen. We, we, were, we were in the first hours of debate and the deal was done. So this gives just a bit of an example of how this government really does not care about the uh, elected people representing this country and how they are to, to uh, function within the responsibilities of this parliament. So, Mr. Speaker, how much time do I have left? Seven minutes. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. So, as I said, there are so many violations here that we have been discussed throughout the day in addition to the Green Slush Fund that you can't but help notice how much Canadians trust in this particular NDP Liberal coalition and in government in general, so many of our institutions, is waning. They're very discouraged because they see all of these ethical violations that have taken place over and over again on that side of the floor, and yet there is no sense of having to apologize or to change their behaviour on behalf of Canadians. And then abusing employees is something that, you know, to, to enable them to give funds to those that should not receive those funds. So in other words, I'm sorry, I, I can't help but think it's a very good thing that we have made the decision to request that these papers get to where they should be and get to the RCMP so that that criminality can be explored. And then there's the question of financial management. And you know, what do they say? You can give benefit of the doubt the first time when you hear, oh, you know, an error. And I believe the, the new minister even said, you know, as soon as we heard, we acted. Well, two years later, I'm sorry, it was the result of whistleblowers uh, that we are here dealing with this today. So are they not capable to run this government? in a respectful, transparent way that makes proper use of Canadian tax dollars? So are they not capable or are they just indifferent? Here they are in places of power and not truly giving proper oversight to uh, the departments that they are responsible for. So that speaks to, I think, 
not only indifference, but the potential for that incapability to do their job, to, to uh, ensure that their departments are being run properly. But then there's the third thing, and I think this is the one that is now so obvious to Canadians, um, and that is a very self-serving agenda. That it's not about Canadians, it's not about serving Canadians, but it's about serving themselves and their friends and focused on political gain at all costs rather than to do the right thing for Canadians. So the Auditor General's report showed that over $400 million have been awarded to projects that either shouldn't have been eligible or were awarded to projects in which the board members were conflicted during the five-year audit period. This is so, you know what, a, a preschooler could understand the importance of doing this properly and would be able to see very clearly where this government, if they knew these are the things that are expected uh, in these roles, they would see very clearly that this did not match that. I just want to uh, follow up that part about speaking about an indifference and uh, self-serving with a quote that I've used before, and it, 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 it speaks to the very essence of what we're hearing in this circumstance and so many other conflicts by this government. And it is, it's hard not to feel disappointed in your government when every day there's a new scandal. And these are the words of this Prime Minister as member of Papineau when he was in the opposition. And I know we've heard a lot, well, you know, you can't blame us because you did the same thing. Well, <laughs> not true. Not true, Mr. Speaker. But his words, we'll get into that, but his words absolutely ring true today. After nine years of scandal, corruption, liberal entitlement, the business of the House has been put on hold to discuss this scandal of mon monumental proportions and to request and demand what should be done, rightfully so, by this government. Simply release those documents as they have been required to do by this place, by the vote of the membership of this House who have the right to demand those documents be presented, not presented redacted, not presented uh, in piecemeal, but be presented as required and as the Speaker of the House indicated that they were not doing that and those documents need to be shared and they need to be provided to the RCMP so that the proper work can be done that respects Canadians' uh, intelligence, their hearts and their love for this country and their tax dollars. So I just want to comment on a couple of more things. The Auditor General gave SDTC a clean bill of health in 2017. So, what does that say? It was only after the Prime Minister's mm -hmm. hand-picked Liberal Board mm -hmm. of Members were appointed mm -hmm. that this fund began voting itself absurd amounts of taxpayer dollars. And it is not arm's length from the government. The Minister recommended board appointments and ISED had senior department officials sitting in when every meeting monitoring the activities of the board and do nothing about it. It is unbelievable that a department, senior department official would say nothing while witnessing how many millions of dollars were funded to companies in which board members held conflicts of interest. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'll just end with one more quote. If I have time. One minute. Okay. Well, basically, it was the Prime Minister himself in 2016 saying how proud he was to be the Prime Minister, which means first servant of Canadians. But he also made the point of saying that Canada is now the first post-national state, which to me was a very serious comment that basically indicated he was not concerned about Canada and who it is. He wasn't concerned about its sovereignty, but it was a post-national state that he was prepared to run into the ground for his own ideological uh, purposes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
Questions and comments. Uh, Kessia Kamaltair, uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, Government House Leader. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Really and truly, the Conservative reformers across the way need to read and better understand why it is Stephen Harper was the only Prime Minister in the history of Canada who was found in contempt. Why is that relevant? Think of the character of their current leader. Their current leader was the Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister back then, uh, Mr. Speaker. Underst and is there any, you know, why wouldn't someone understand why that is not important to today? When you have the leader of the Conservative Party saying, I don't want to get the security uh, clearance so I can get more information about the uh, members of Parliament. I'll end with a quote, and maybe the member can provide her response to this quote. Wesley Wark, who has advised both Liberal and Conservative governments on national security issues, said the Tory uh, leader is knowingly misleading the public by claiming he doesn't need the security clearance because his chief of staff has received briefings. The leader of the Conservative Party is playing games with Canadians. When is the game going to stop and when will he get that security clearance? Member for Yorkton, Melville. Don't debate the, the member across the floor is playing games. Bottom line. And here's the thing. Do you know who's in contempt of court? The NDP Liberal Coalition. It's time to get those papers here and to the RCMP. Do your job. Questions and comments? Question commentaire. The Honourable Member for Bertie Masquinanger. Good morning, Mr. Speaker, or good afternoon, rather. Thank you for recognizing me. I'd like to thank my colleague. He did take up all this time in the House to say that the documents have to be remitted, and I'd like to tell him something that's not a scoop. We all agree with this, Mr. Speaker. So through you, I'd like to ask him, well, we all agree on, on this, we want to force the government to remit these documents. Could he tell me about when they'll be ready to vote on this? I think we could be ready today, tomorrow. We're ready, and the vote will go through. We're going to support them on this. Are we ready to vote on this? The Honourable Member for Yorkton Melville. Well, what, what we request and what we are looking for and what we expect is that this government do the right thing and hand over those documents. Come on, Terry. Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for Maple Ridge. Pitt Meadows, Maple, Maple Ridge. Thank Great. you. I'd like to uh, thank the member for Yorkton Melville for her comments. Uh, one of the things that uh, struck me was the word uh, self serving. And uh, there's one example that um, um, comes to mind. There's many examples, but what comes to mind is one of the board members who received a quarter of a billion dollars uh, for her companies. And we have the Minister for Environment and, and, uh, ter and Climate Change that actually was a uh, lobbyist with them and has shares of the company and met with the, I believe, the PMO's office a dozen times before getting elected. So I just wonder uh, if the member would be able to comment a bit more on that as far as almost the self-serving, incestuous to be, uh, relationship that, uh, that they seem to have with, with the, sort of the slush fund. The yeah, member for Yorkton Melville. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And through you, uh, the individual being spoken of, uh, the Minister of the Environment, uh, you know, uh, chides continually about the needs and, and the reason for why that carbon tax has to go up and up and up to where it's, it's basically debilitating Canadians from being able to function in their homes, to be able to run our businesses. All of the things that Canadians need to do are being impacted by this carbon tax, and yet this individual has personally gained in those circumstances, and this slush fund has handed out millions of Canadian tax dollars to uh, companies uh, that are not appropriate to have the funds and aren't even doing anything specific to improve uh, the environment. Something very important to me, to uh, my constituents, to the whole province of Saskatchewan, where we've been on the cutting edge of being concerned about uh, the Canadian environment as a whole and certainly where we work and play. Questions and comments? Uh, question commentaire, uh, the Honourable Member for... Honourable Member, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I asked the question several times about what we could do to avoid these type of situations from repeating themselves. They don't. Conservatives don't be, seem to be interested in this. 
they've already uh, uh, looked at the same question about the refusal to table documents. We agree that we want the Liberals to do this, but what guarantees us that the Liberals, uh, the Conservatives rather, won't be doing uh, the same things as in the few years if they form the government? Captain Melville. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Listen, it was our government that created the first Federal Accountability Act. So any, can you imagine where we would be at today if we had not put the things in place that we have already done mm -hmm. so? And the point being that we, those things apply as much to us when we form government as anyone who has that privilege and responsibility. So I am very proud of my leader who has made it clear that the role prime minister means first servant. And we as a caucus, when we form government, will hold each other accountable. That's what conservatives do. And that certainly will be our responsibility. And we will continue to make sure that what happens in this place is, is uh, done ethically and in Canadians' best interests. Mm -hmm. Questions and comments on the Honourable Member for Hamilton Centre. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Pretty straightforward question. For the last three weeks, the Conservatives have framed a situation as being solely a partisan issue from a Liberal insider that received, and I would agree, uh, that received unfavourable treatment, uh, self-dealings, and acted in a, in a corrupt way. However, um, would the Honourable Member care to comment on the fact that the same person in question, Annette Verschuren, received, or sorry, donated to the Conservative Party as recently as May, sorry, March 24th, 2022? So, you know, this is a situation where uh, not only is it a Liberal insider, but it's a Conservative insider as well. Does the Honourable Member care to comment, or do they seem to have amnesia on that fact as well? Here, here. The Honourable Member for Yorkton, Melville. Mr. Speaker, I don't care who gives money where. They don't have a right to break the law. Good answer. Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, Government House Leader. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me uh, make things simpler in terms of the question that I have for the member opposite. I've had members from her ranks today say, tell us the names. Give us the 11 MPs dealing with foreign interference. The leader of the Conservative Party, Mr. Speaker, if he was to get the security clearance, can actually go and get the names. But unlike, unlike the leader of the Bloc, the leader of the Green, the leader of the NDP, and obviously the Prime Minister, he has chosen to be blind on the issue. Can she justify why the leader of the Conservative Party feels it's appropriate to play games with Canadians on this important issue? The Honourable Member Yorkton Melville. The one playing games is the person across the floor. Mm -hmm. Questions and comments? Question you know, the Honourable Member for... See, I was, I was so ready for Edmonton, e Edmonton West. <laughs> I want to thank my uh, colleague for her excellent talk. This government is rife with, or with corruption. We're actually, for those at home wondering, this is one of three green-related scandals going on right now. Of course, there's a the green slush fund. There's one involving the Environment Department giving out millions in grants to massive corporations without any oversight or governments or governance, and then also the Net Zero Accelerator, where they gave out $8 billion to wealthy foreign corporations that weren't eligible for the money. I wonder if my colleague could tell us what it says about this government that they have so many scandals going on, they have subsets of subsets of subsets of scandals. The Honourable Member for Yorkton, Melville. Thank you so much to, to my colleague for the question. Okay, I have one minute. Um, here's what I would say. Somebody needs to write a book, or at least document, <laughs> maybe do a movie someday, I don't know. But the point being that this government is so... Um, I, I don't think they, they, they have any item of business in this House that isn't somehow impacted by their, their choices to, to focus on self and those that support them rather than do what is best for Canadians. And I can hardly wait until we have the opportunity to change government.